I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm just fine, too. But you know, there's one question in my mind. What's that? Are you working real hard in school? Oh, yes, I am. Well, I'm glad to hear that, because it won't be long now before the school year will be over. No, it won't. Only about another month and a half, about, isn't that right? Yes, and that means it isn't long until examination time. And that'll be your last chance to improve your marks this year. Yes, I know. So I'm studying real hard so I can learn as much as I can before school gets out. Oh, that's fine. I can see you want to get good marks. Oh, yes, I do, because good marks are a sign of how well you've learned what you study. That's right. It tells you how well you remember what you study. Yes, that's right. Well, I'm glad to know that you're working real hard. Thank you. Now, will you please read me the funny? Puck the Comic yes. Weekly? Very well. I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do... Let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the first section under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <laughs> Half the guys in camp have been issued passes permitting them to go to town, but Beetle and Killer have to stay at camp. They're walking over to the camp service club. Beetle complains, Why won't they give us all passes to town? Killer replies, Why, well, half of us are going to stay here for the security of the post. They start to cross the road just as a car approaches. But the fellows pay no attention. The driver swerves off the road to avoid hitting them and crashes into a telephone pole. picture top row. They're in the service club washroom. Beetle, who's finished washing his hands, turns his back on the running faucet. Uh, do you really think the camp would be in danger if we weren't here? Killer suddenly exclaims, Hey, you left your faucet on. The water's running all over the floor. First picture bottom row, they're relaxing on a sofa in the service club. Killer's saying, you know, if we weren't on duty, anything might happen. Beetle empties his pipe in the wastebasket. Well, it's good to know we're here for some useful purpose. Suddenly, Beetle hears the club hostess shouting, Fire! Fire! He looks around to see the wastebasket on fire. He and Killer dash for the fire extinguishers. Hey, come on, Beetle, come on. It's a good thing we're around. They turn on the fire extinguishers. The chemical squirts out all over the room. Hey, turn that off. You're ruining my uniform. Turn it the other way, you fool. The fire's over there, not my sweater. Hey, throw those guys out of here, somebody. They'll wreck the place. <laughs> Last picture, Beetle and Killer have been brought before the sergeant by the military police. The sergeant is saying, Here's two passes. Now get going. But what about the security of the post? The military police answers, That's why we're giving you the two passes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those boys, they always get into trouble. No matter what they do, they get into trouble. Yes, and I think I agree with the officer. Everything is safer around the camp if Beetle's sent off to town. <laughs> yes. Nothing is safe with him around. Yes, nothing is safe with him around. <laughs> Now let's see what's happening to Peter Pan. Turn over the page, go past Little Iodine, across page three past Prince Val, turn over that page, and here on page four is Peter Pan. Yes, Peter Pan. And you remember that Captain Hook, who hates Peter Pan, found Peter's hiding place. That's right. Last week, the pirates captured all the children. 
And then Captain Hook dropped the packages down the hollow tree, and I'm sure there's a bomb in it. Well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised because Captain Hook wants to get rid of Peter Pan. And last week, Peter picked up the package, and I wonder if it will explode. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Peter Pan. Say the magic words with me. Pirates, Pirates crocodiles, crocodiles, Peter Pan, Pan. whisk up music for Never 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 Land. Land. Unaware that Wendy and the boys have been seized by the pirates, Peter examines the mysterious package left by Captain Hook. He finds a note on the package. To Peter, with love, from Wendy. Do not open till six o'clock. Hmm. Little Tinkerbell, who had been captured by Captain Hook and made a prisoner in a small lantern, listens as the pirates bring the children aboard the ship. And she sees the children tied to the main mast. Then she sees Captain Hook take out a book and hold out a pen and say to the children, Now, me hearties, the choice is up to you. Sign up for the crew or walk the plank. Last picture, top row, Wendy answers proudly. Captain Hook, we'll not join your crew. Peter Pan will save us. (laughs) (laughs) The pirates roar with laughter. Second picture, bottom row, Captain Hook walks over to Wendy and bows before her. Pardon me, my dear, but you're not in on our little joke. You see, we left a present for Peter. The captain's man, Smee, adds, Yeah, a sort of surprise package. Yes, indeed, my dear. It contains an ingenious device set for six o'clock, when Peter Pan will be blasted out of Neverland forever. At last picture, Tinkerbell hears Hook's dreadful words. She frantically hurls herself against her glass prison, trying to escape. I was right. I was right. I said a bomb was in that package, and I was right. Yes, you were right. And Peter was sitting holding that package in his lap. Oh, I hope Tinkerbell escapes so she can warn Peter not to open the package. So do I. Do you think she will escape? Well, maybe we'll find out about that next week. I'll look across the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. And you remember last week, Roy learned that Snapper Sloan, the cattleman, had been leading the raids against the farmer. That's right. Roy was hot on the trail of Sloan and his sidekick, Pete. And Pete looked over his shoulder and saw Roy approaching and warned Snapper Sloan. And then Snapper Sloan pulled out his gun and knocked Pete subconscious. I wonder why he did that to his own partner. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Hi yip by yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip by yo Snapper Sloan reins in and leaps off his horse. He drags Pete's body off the road over to a rock. Then props it up against the rock overlooking the road. <clears throat> Sorry I had to knock you off, Pete. But I'm gonna use you to draw Roger's fire. Then I can catch him off guard at no risk. A few minutes later, Roy, who is following the tracks, comes around a bend. He sees the figure in the shadow of the rock. Hey, that looks like Sloan's sidekick, Pete, guarding the trail, Trigger. Roy fires. (coughs) Pete's hat flies off. But Pete doesn't fire back. Roy dismounts. Cautiously approaches Pete. Last picture, top row. Well, that's funny. I didn't even try to hit him. Yet he seems groggy. First picture, bottom row, Roy orders. All right, toss away your rifle, Pete, and start talking. Where's Snapper Sloan? Pete, who's coming to, drops his rifle. And then says, I ain't coming back to me. He conked me on the head when he saw you were trailing us. But why? At that moment, Snapper Sloan steps out from behind some bushes, gun aimed at Roy's back. Because I needed Pete for bait to get the drop on you, Rogers. Drop your gun. Roy drops his gun and says, Well, now, before you put a slug into me, how about spilling why you want to run the nesters out of the valley, Sloan? Farm fences keep steers from grass and water holes, Rogers. Suddenly, Trigger, who's behind Sloan, rears up and knocks Sloan over. <coughs> now Pete reaches for his rifle. Roy gives the rifle a kick. No, you don't, Pete. Nice work, Trigger. Yes. Just when it looked like Snapper Sloan was going to shoot Roy, Trigger knocked him over and saved Roy's life. Yes, 
Yes, what a wonderful horse Trigger is. Yes, and now Roy kicks the gun out of Pete's hands, too. I wonder if that means that Roy is in command of the situation. Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now it's time for Flash Gordon. So let's go to the very last page of the first section. Oh, yes, and here's Flash. And he's on the moon, you remember? And he's having lots of trouble. Yes, you bet he is. He's encountered some space pirates who are under the leadership of a man named Mark, who had captured Zarkov and Dale, Flash's friends. But Flash finally got his rocket ship back, and he escaped. And now Flash has a chance to fight Mark with good weapons. Oh, I wonder whether he'll be able to save Zarkov and Dale now and defeat Mark. Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon saskamatas. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Zooming his rocket high over the pirate stronghold, Flash telecasts an ultimatum. Mark, release Dale and Zarkov immediately, or your base will be blasted off the face of the moon. Mark's only answer is a burst of gunfire. <laughs> then Mark issues a command to his crew. Launch a pursuit rocket! The pursuit craft roars into the air. But this time, the pirates are not attacking a clumsy, helpless space freighter. Flash circles with a swift change of course. He blasts the pirate craft with a single lethal atom charge. Mark has seen what happened on his telescreen. And enraged by the loss of his rocket ship, Mark broadcasts a grim threat. This is my last warning, Gordon. Land your rocket and surrender, or you will never see Dale and Zarkov alive again. First picture, bottom row. Flash stalls for time. He pretends to follow Mark's orders. He points his ship down toward the moon base, and he says, All right, clear the rocket pit for my landing. Gliding toward the rocket pit, last picture, Flash takes a desperate gamble. Changing course at the last moment, he aims his craft at the thin shell of the moon station as far as possible from the area in which Dale and Zarkov are held captive. Straight forward he dives. There's a thunderous blast and a blinding flame as the rocket rips into the moon station. And all is deathly quiet. Ooh, that was terribly, terribly dangerous. Diving that rocket ship straight down to the moon base. Yes, I can't think of anything more dangerous than that. Flash really took a chance. How could Flash ever crash like that and not be killed? I was thinking the same thing. Do you think Dale and Zarkov will be alive? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page of the second section. And I'll read them in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Blondie and the kids have left the house for the afternoon. Last picture, top row, Dagwood is in the bathroom, enjoying a soothing, relaxing soak in the bathtub. Ah, peace and quiet. There's nothing so good for the nerves as to lie in a tub of steaming water and soak. Uh Uh-oh, the doorbell. I'm in the tub! Who's at the door? But there's no answer. Oh, dear. Dagwood climbs out of the tub and opens the bathroom window. Sticks his head out, first picture, second row. Who's at the door? A voice floats up. Ah, it's Mr. Dithers, Dagwood. I have to talk to you about these blueprints at once. A few minutes later, second picture, second row. Mr. Dithers is sitting on a stool beside the bathtub, showing Dagwood the blueprints. Now, uh, uh, we'll send that set and uh, keep this in our files. And Dagwood, who's still in the bathtub, answers, 
Yeah, yeah, that's the way I do it. Now, if we can only figure out a way. Last picture, second row. Blondie comes to a fruit stand. Oh, those delicious-looking berries. They'll be wonderful for canning. Yes, ma'am, they are. And they look wonderful in jars. First picture, third row, Blondie exclaims. I want my husband to see them before I decide. The berry man picks up two cartons of berries. I'll deliver them personally, Mrs. Bombstead. Second picture, third row. The berry man comes up to the Bumstead house. The door opens and Mr. Dithers comes out. Oh, uh, he's upstairs in the bathtub. First door to your left. Thank you. Last picture, third row. The berry man appears in the door of the bathroom. Dagwood looks up, sees a bar of soap on the floor. Hey, watch out for that soap! But it's too late. <laughs> Oh, oh, dear. And first picture, bottom row, the berries are all over the bathroom. And the berry man is in the tub with Dagwood. Dagwood looks around the room disgustedly. The berry man says sweetly, uh, Well, where do you keep your broom? I'll help you clean it up. I'm not going to clean it up. I'm going to get dressed and go to the movies. <laughs> An hour later, Blondie, back from shopping, looks through the house for Dagwood. She comes into the bathroom, and she sees berries on the floor, in the tub, on the wall, and on the ceiling. And she goes... Someday I'm going to stay home and see what goes on around here while I'm away. <laughs> oh. Poor Dagwood. He didn't have much peace and quiet, did he? <laughs> no, he didn't. And didn't Blondie look surprised when she saw her berries in the bathtub? Yes. What would she do with them? Run the cold water out, run the hot water in, and make berry sauce in the bathtub. Oh, oh that's funny. Make berry sauce in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah. Now let's turn over the page. And look, on page three of the second section, there's Donald Duck. Oh, my favorite favorite. And I'll read your favorite favorite right away. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiggly chicka chat. Let's have, have music, you better quack, quack. It's a very rainy day. Donald and his nephews come home and make a rush for the door. But the door is locked, and Donald can't find the key. Are you sure we had it when we left? Louie says, Well, not positive. And Huey exclaims, It's not in the mailbox. And Dewey says, Or under the mat. And Louie says, Hey, why don't you bust the window? And spend ten bucks. <laughs> no, sir, red. So Donald walks over to a tree that stands close to the house and starts to climb up. He tries again. But he can't make it. Come on, come on, boost. Give me a push, will you? What's the matter with you? Give me a push. So his nephews give him a push. And slowly Donald goes up, 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 up the tree. Then he crawls out along a branch. Then drops from the tree onto the roof. And last picture top row, he reaches down and opens an upstairs window. First picture, bottom row, he hangs onto the eaves. Oh, boy, oh, boy, hope I miss him. And then swings himself through the window and lands on the floor. So hard, his head aches. Oh, boy. He staggers to his feet and weaves his way down the stairs. Oh, wow. His head aching harder with every step. And then he stops in amazement. For there, in the house, at the foot of the stairs, stands Louie, Dewey, and Huey. And Dewey holds up the key in triumph and says proudly, Louie had it in his hat. And Donald exclaims, Oh, I'm going to trouble that with you. Poor Donald, after all that work to get in the house, climbing on the roof and everything, then he discovers that the boys had the key after all. Yes, I don't blame him for being angry. No, neither do I. Donald, everything turns out the wrong way for him. Yes. Well, now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look. It's adventure. Yes. A 
on the very last page of Fox the Comic Weekly. And as you remember, Dick is in the early days of America. Yes, that's right. He's in Texas. And at that time, Texas was just on his feet into Mexico and the crew of Mexican general named General Santa Ana. That's right. But Dick's friend, Jim Bowie, had heard that the Mexicans under General Santa Ana were on their way to attack the Texans again. And so Dick and Jim Bowie, they were about to investigate. Wonder what they will learn. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggity pack, a zack, a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. From the Texas bluffs overlooking the Rio Grande River, Dick and Jim Bowie sight General Santa Ana's advancing army, some 4,000 strong. Bowie says to Dick, All right, ride, Dick. We gotta warn the others so we can prepare a defense. Last picture top row, after a long, hard ride, they reach San Antonio. Learning the ominous news, the fighters for Texas independence make an immediate decision to fight. First picture, second row, General Sam Houston has saddled up and is ready to ride off to raise an army across Texas. Bowie says to Dick, You better go with him, Dick. Nobody's got much of a chance here. And then he adds grimly, But I'm staying. Last picture, second row. Dick looks over the assembled men. He sees that Davy Crockett, William Travis, and about 200 others are also making no attempt to leave. Bowie draws. Might be able to slow Santa Ana down a bit until Sam Houston gets his army ready. First picture, bottom row. Bowie turns to Dick and says, well, Go ahead, boy. Catch up with Sam before it's too late. No. If you're staying, Jim, I'm staying. I'll stay and fight, too. And last picture, all that day and all through the night, a small band of defenders move ammunition and supplies behind the strong walls of the deserted mission of the Alamo. And as dawn breaks, the dust of Santa Ana's approaching horde is already rising above the nearby hilltop. That's right, and 4,000 soldiers in the approaching Mexican army. And the Texans are going to stay there and fight? Yes, as Bowie said, they're going to fight a delaying action that'll hold the Texans for a while, while General Sam Houston can raise a big army. Oh, but how can they ever hope to fight 4,000 soldiers? Well, I'm wondering the same thing. And we'll find out more about that next week. But now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and you remember, Rusty's a Denver Dooley. That's right, and when he got to the farm, he found that there were two crooks on the place who had locked Miss Dooley up in the attic. Yes, Rusty discovered that when the two crooks were in town, and Rusty was going to call the police when the crooks came back and caught him with the phone in his hand. And the crooks decided it was time to leave the place, and Trixie, the girl who seems to be the boss of the two, had told Mel, who was posing as the hired man, to take care of Rusty and Miss Dooley. I'm sure she means to do something dangerous to them. I wonder what it will be. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Mel has put Miss Dooley in the back seat of the car. First picture, he tells Rusty, All right, get behind the wheel of that car, kid, and drive to the place I tell you. I'll be in the back seat with a gun, so don't get any ideas. Carly, you've got poor Miss Dooley in there. You, you shouldn't do this. She's sick. Second picture. Rusty's been directed to drive the car to a place out in the woods where a door opens to an underground room. As Rusty stops the car, he says, What are we going to do here? This is just an old spring house. Exactly. And it's going to be the permanent address of you and the old woman from now on. Mel forces Rusty and Miss Dooley to get out of the car. All right. Get in there. Rusty and Miss Dooley go into the spring house. Last picture, top row. Mel starts to close the door. Rusty says, Jeepers, mister, you can't leave us locked up in this place. Miss Dooley, she, she's awful sick. She, well, she'll die. 
Yeah, very sad. But you shouldn't have been so nosy. Meanwhile, first picture bottom row in the town of Honey Hollow, the banker and Jim Woods have come to talk to the sheriff because they've been wondering why Miss Dooley hasn't been seen in town for some time. The sheriff is saying, uh, <clears throat> You say you think something's wrong out at the Dooley farm? Well, you better give me the facts, Sam. Well, it's, uh, it's really just a hunch, Sheriff, but I agree with Jim Woods that it wouldn't hurt to run out there. Now, come on, Sheriff, I got my car outside. Short time later, the Sheriff and the two men are ringing Miss Dooley's doorbell. Where nobody answers the bell? Uh, wait here. I'm going to take a look in the barn. Yeah, there surely ought to be somebody around. <laughs> A few minutes later, the sheriff joins Jim and Sam at the house again. Nothing in the barn but two half-starved horses. Come on, we're going in the house. Jim Woods tries the door. Why, hey, the door isn't locked. They go into the house and find it a shambles. Good night. Look at this room. Yeah, looks like they made a quick getaway. I darn if I know why. They go out of the house again. Rusty's dog flips, sees them, and runs about barking nervously. Last picture, Jim Woods exclaims, Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. That pup was with the boy who cashed the check in my feed store. Now look, he's sure acting funny. Ooh, I'm glad the Sheriff and the others came there. So am I, but it's too bad they didn't get there a little sooner. Yes, then they could have caught the crooks before they lost Rusty and Miss Dooley out. Yes, they would have. But don't forget, though, they see Rusty's dog flip. Oh, yes, and maybe Flip will lead them to where Rusty well, let's hope he does. We'll find out next week if that happens. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tony Giggly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.